So I'm so excited to be here. I pray that you're doing well. Let's go ahead and pray before we get into the Word. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for everything that you have provided for us, God. You are so good, and we are so blessed, Father. And right now, I pray that you would just anoint this message, and Holy Spirit, that you would come into this place, and that everyone who's listening right now uh, would, would receive what you have given me to speak to them today, God. I pray that uh, it would find good soil in our hearts, God, that it would convict where needed and encourage in areas that we need encouragement, Father. And I give you praise, Father, and I ask for your blessing upon this servant, Father. I ask that you would touch my body and that you would touch my mind and that my, uh, my words would be clear and that I would have a clear mind to deliver what you gave me in your precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. Well, church, I have a couple questions for you. Uh, and this is going to be a little bit different, but you just got to bear with me. The Lord asked me to change it up. This isn't typically how I would do a sermon, uh, but uh, I just want to be obedient and share what the Holy Spirit put on my heart. So the first question that I want to ask you today is this. If today was your last day, if it was your last day, what accomplishments in your life up to this point would you be most proud of? What accomplishments would you be proud of if today was your last day? Now, I know this is a difficult question. I know it's a question that makes us think and evaluate our heart. And maybe you're sitting there thinking, well, I'm proud of my family. Like, that seems safe, right? Like, that, that's probably not too arrogant to say. And I agree. I think it's, it's great to be proud of your family. And uh, maybe you're a parent and you're like, well, my kids are serving God, so I'm proud of that. Um, maybe you're uh, someone in business and your company's done really well. And you're like, you know, I'm proud of what I've accomplished. I was able to accomplish my goals and, uh, you know, something like that. And, and I understand, you know, those, those make a lot of sense to me. And then my question number two for you would be very similar, but slightly different. If today was your last day, what accomplishments in your life up to this point would God be proud of? What accomplishments in your life up to this point would God be be proud of. Now that one always seems a bit harder to answer. And it's a question that has honestly cooked my brain uh, for the better part of 30 years. And uh, I, I don't really have a perfect answer for that. But today I would like to explore a bit uh, of the idea of what, what constitutes uh, an accomplishment in life that delights our Father in heaven. And so today I've titled my message, the vessel. And, the, and today it's all about exploring what is this idea of being a vessel of God's work. And so I'd like to take you on a little journey that starts back with me as five years old, and I'm in Sunday school class. And uh, my Sunday school teacher was Nadine Goldeisen, and she attends this church today. And I am so proud to be one of her spiritual grandkids. And I remember during this class, we had, we had the good old flannel board. And I, how many of you uh, can remember back to where you had Sunday school and, and they were using a flannel board with you know, the, the stick-on figures and everything? Uh, I, I, there's probably a lot of uh, young kids that don't have a clue what we're talking about. But if you're old enough to remember that, it was legit. It was super cool. And I'm like secretly hoping that flannel boards make their way back. Um, and anyway, in this particular Sunday school class, uh, she was teaching us the story of Elijah. And there was a the little cutout of Elijah, and they were on a mountain, Mount Carmel, and they had uh, little altars. And this is a story of when Elijah is going up against the false prophets of Baal. And Israel has turned their back on God. And Elijah stands alone to defend God. And he challenges the false prophets of Baal to a trial of fire, essentially. They both build altars. They put a sacrifice on the altar. And they are both to pray to their God. And whoever's God sends fire to consume the offering is the God, the one and true God. So Elijah allows the false prophets to go first. And they're doing all sorts of crazy things. And I mean, they're running around dancing and, 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 and shouting and cutting themselves, bleeding all over the place. And Baal does not answer. No fire comes from heaven and the offering of the false prophets remains. And then that's where we pick up in 1 Kings. So check out 1 Kings 18. 36 through 39. 
Then at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet approached and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, today let it be known that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, Lord, answer me so this people may know that you, Lord, are God and that you have turned their heart back. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell on their faces and said, Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. How incredible, and what, what an incredible moment. And I remember as a small boy thinking, oh man, I want God to use me like that. And I, I, I think as a five-year-old boy, I just wanted to be able to command fire from heaven, you know? I mean, let's be real. Let's, let's be real here. And I, I remember raising my hand, and, uh, and Nadine called on me, and she said, what is it, Justin? And I said, well, I just have a question. I want to know why God doesn't use people today like he did back then. And she took a moment and she thought, and I'm sure she could have given me many examples of miraculous things happening in our church and other churches that she knew about with our missionaries on the mission field. But instead, she responded differently. And she said, you know, Justin, I think that's a question for you to ask God about. And I'm so thankful that she responded that way because now I look back on that and that truly was the inception of the first time I ever brought a petition, a request to God. And so I remember going home and going in my bedroom and closing the door and getting on my knees and saying, Lord, why don't you use people today like you did back then? And I waited and I tried to be real patient and I waited for what seemed like forever but I mean, let's be real. For a little boy, that's like a couple minutes, right? And so I didn't get an answer. And for a few days over and over again, I would get on my knees in my bedroom and, and pray, Lord, why don't you use people today like you did back then? And still no answer. And then I remember one night as I was laying in bed about to fall asleep and I had just finished my prayers and I thought, you know, I'm gonna pray it one more time. And I said, Lord, why don't you use people today like you did back then? And I'll never forget this moment. I heard this still small voice inside of me that I was not familiar with. And the voice said to me, I still can, but are you willing to pay the price that they did? Now, I don't know about your understanding as a five-year-old, but for me, these words were pretty intense. And I wasn't really sure what that meant, paid the price. Like I was like looking back through the scriptures and asking people uh, that could, could read better and help me, because obviously a five-year-old can't read very good, <laughs> even though I had the little precious moments Bible, but let's be honest, you know, no five-year-olds reading that very well. And I was asking, I'm like, I don't understand. Was there an exchange of money? What price did they pay? And I, I kept looking for this, this ic, ic explanation. And so this would be a quest that I would go on for the next 30 years. And at the end of the sermon, I'm going to give you what after 30 years I have concluded to be, to the best of my knowledge as a 35-year-old man, what God was trying to say to me that day. I think oftentimes we get in a hurry when God speaks and the Holy Spirit speaks to us and teaches us and we expect to understand and have the answer right away. And that isn't always how it works. Sometimes it takes a lot of time and effort to be put into understanding the things of God. And so I remember as I grew, these Bible characters in Scripture, man, they became my heroes. They were my superheroes. I didn't know much about Marvel Comics or DC Comics, but I knew this. These Bible characters were awesome. And they were doing incredible things for God. And I developed this perception that was clearly these people who are doing these wonderful things for God, they must have a real relationship for God. And therefore, anyone who does great things externally for God is in good standing with God. Now, 
as a five-year-old, this idea of favor of God and, 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 and a litmus test, if you will, uh, for being a vessel that God's using and, and, and is in good standing with, I mean, it only works for so long, right? Because as you grow and your reading skills develop and you're able to read more and you look at these characters in the Bible, you realize they're very flawed. And I'm like, wait a minute, I thought that all these people who did these great things for God, that they were just these perfect people. And these external evidences show that how, how, how close they were to God. And then I started to realize that they were really flawed. There was a lot of things going on with them that I'm like, uh, man, they're jacked up. They're really messed up. Which, of course, as I grew older was comforting because by that point I had clearly realized that I was not perfect by any stretch of the imagination and that it was encouraging to see but I still couldn't comprehend why these great things could happen and it would be imperfect people. And I, I still kind of kept the thought that if great things are happening through someone, God is with them. And as I grew to the age of 13, the Lord led me in my study time to three verses that wouldn't just poke a hole in that theory. It would obliterate it altogether. So let's check out Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast, uh, and in your name we cast out demons? And in your name we performed miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Leave me, you who practice lawlessness." Now, this verse wrecked my world. I'm like, I, I don't understand, Lord. How can, how can these people be doing amazing things for you and then you reject them and you say that you never knew them? And with the help of the Holy Spirit and good teachers and, and uh, good friends, I started to realize that there's something so much deeper at work that there's, there's more than just the externals. I know in American culture, we like to look at the exter external uh, appearance of the vessel and, and, and say, man, look at them. They got it together. They must be living the life. I bet you they never argue or have any problems. God's just with them. The favor of the Lord's all over them. And I think we all know that everybody goes through difficulty, right? Everybody struggles. But as far as how it was related to having a, a good relationship with God, I still was wondering, and I still was searching. And then God took me to another uh, set of three verses in 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3. It says this, if I speak with the tongues of mankind and angels, but do not have love, I have become, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so to, as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give away all my possessions to charity, and if I suffer my body, or excuse me, if I surrender my body so that I may glory, which is another way of saying uh, surrender your body, body uh, to be martyred for the Lord, but I do not have love, it does me no good. So this reiterated again, I'm like, wait a minute. Like, this passage is literally saying I could be martyred for God. But if I don't exude the love of God, then it does me no good that it's not pleasing to God. And this really shook me. And it really made me question like, Lord, I, I want to be your servant. I want to do what pleases you, what you, what you delight in. But I, I, I didn't really understand fully. And so then as I grow into my teenage years, I discover this concept in scripture that is a very real reality of what will happen to us at some day as believers. Uh, and it's called the judgment seat of Christ. And you may have heard of this also referred to as the believer's judgment. And the good news about this is, and we need to be very clear about this because there is some confusion and not everybody understands, uh, this judgment, if you're at this judgment, you made it to heaven, okay? Okay. This judgment isn't to determine whether or not you get into heaven or not. This is a judgment for the believers of Jesus Christ. 
And what this judgment is, is to determine the worth and value of the works and accomplishments that we produced in our life for God. And so I thought, okay, this sounds like what I'm looking for. I'm I'm on this quest to figure out what does it mean to be a good and willing vessel for the Lord. I see all these great pillars of faith in Scripture, but I also see that people can accomplish great things for God and still never really know Him. So maybe if I study this judgment a bit, I'll get a better understanding and a better grasp of what it means to please God. So let's check out some scriptures on this regarding the judgment seat of Christ. 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 15. For no one can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become evident For the day, and that means the day of judgment, for the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each one's work. If anyone's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved yet only so as through fire. And then let's continue on to 2 Corinthians 5, 9 through 10, starting in verse 9. Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive compensation for his deeds done through the body in accordance with what he has done, whether good or bad. And then lastly, I want to leave you with this verse, and this is Proverbs 16, 2. All the ways of a person are clean in his own sight, but the Lord examines the motives. Now, my understanding of this judgment has always been essentially what I could read there. And I knew that there was a a major key to understanding being a delight in the sight of the Lord and what um, we could accomplish for him versus, uh, you know, what in our selfish carnal nature thinks is good works for the kingdom. After all, we see the interactions of Jesus with the Pharisees and just how much he, he was trying to get through to them that, you know, you're so religious, you're so legalistic that you're completely missing the heart of the matter. And so fast forward to present time, about two months ago, on the day of Pentecost here at the church, we had a night of prayer and worship. And I remember saying, Lord, I just want to understand this more. This uh, judgment seat of Christ had been on my heart and I had been praying about it. And I remember coming into worship. And then uh, as worship began, I was standing over where, where I normally am. And I began to receive a vision from God. And before I go into this church, I want to make sure that you understand that this this isn't something that's half-baked in my mind, if you will. It's not something that I uh, rushed through. Uh, I wasn't really eager to share it because the imagery was so powerful. I was like, Lord, is this this something you've shown me that's private just for Justin? Or is this something that's for corporate use as well, or even both? And so after two months of praying into it and really seeking the Lord for the peace of the Holy Spirit, I received it and he gave me clear boundaries as to what I could share. And so today I want to share that with you and I pray that the imagery that he gave me will speak to your heart and it will teach you something. Now I also want to be very clear, please, this is not meant to be a textbook definition of what heaven is or isn't going to be. I'm not writing a book about it. (laughs) I mean, honestly, I I think this was a a poetic way of teaching that the Holy Spirit used to instill in me these principles of what it means to be a vessel for good use for God. So I want to dive into this and and reveal to you what God showed me. But before I do that, I have to start a fire. So if you'll bear with me and just hang in there, we will get this going. There we go. Hopefully you all can see that. So I'm sitting over here during worship, and as soon as the first song begins, and I begin to praise, God takes me and gives me a vision of this 
immaculate room. It was incredible, church. It was a, it was a, a perfect square room, and the walls were like frosted glass. I don't know if you've ever seen a shower that has like that frosted white glass on it where, you know, you can, it's somewhat translucent. You can see things behind it, but not in great clarity. And so it was like that was every wall and the floor. And I remember in the middle of the the front of this room, there were steps that led up to this throne. And on this, this throne looked like it was maybe made out of solid diamond or crystal or something like that. And I was just thinking, wow, this is amazing. I don't know where I am, but this is beautiful. And I I don't know what's going on yet. And then a being appears through a door that I never saw initially. The door just appeared out of nowhere and then it closed behind him and disappeared. And this being steps out and I can tell that it's a man, but it's as if his entire being was on fire, like white flame, like small white flames covering the entire shape of this man's body. And I'm like, oh my goodness. And I could barely look at it, look at him because it was so bright. And he, he walks up the steps and he sits down on the throne and it was as if the brightness that was on him emitted through the throne and the entire room began to glow with his glory. And at this point, I came to the knowledge that this has to be Jesus Christ. This has to be Jesus Christ. And if I'm in a room in heaven and Jesus is on the throne, then this might be a moment of judgment. And at this point, I started to panic because I got Jesus on the throne looking like that. And uh, I'm in the room alone and I'm like, is this my judgment? And like, am I being judged right now? And I started to have such a reverent fear come over me. And I was like, Lord, I'm, I'm not ready. And then all of a sudden, two people entered the room from behind me and they walked forward. And I'm like, oh, shoot, I, I'm not a, I'm just a spectator. I'm not a participant. And I was like, all right, I like this. We're okay. <laughs> and I saw a man walk up before the throne and he was carrying a vessel And this vessel was beautiful, made of gold, very ornate. And I don't know if you've ever met someone in your life that when you see them, they just exude confidence. And it's almost like the atmosphere just shifts when they walk in the room. And uh, that's how this man carried himself. I was actually really surprised just how boldly and confident he, he stepped up to the front of the room. And I was like, man, that, that guy's got it going on. And look at, look at that vessel he's carrying. This is, this is incredible. And then on, to contrast, on the other side of the room, I saw this woman walk up and she was carrying her vessel. And it was very plain and very simple. It wasn't made of gold. In fact, it's made of wood. And the quality wasn't great. And she was what the world would maybe describe as plain. And I don't know how I know this, but the Holy, it's as if the Holy Spirit just revealed it to me that she suffered with some kind of intellectual disability. I don't know if she was on the autistic, autistic spectrum or something, but I, I, it had been revealed to me that this woman dealt with that. And so I see this very interesting contrast between these two people. I got this guy over here that's super confident. He's got the golden vessel. And I got this woman over here who's very meek and she's bringing her vessel up before the Lord and it's made of wood and it's, it's not very costly. And so I'm just sitting there watching this and Jesus, as he's on the throne, he looks over to the man and he says, pour out your life before me. I get, I get goosebumps even just thinking about uh, these moments that I'm remembering. And the man takes his vessel and he pours it out. And from within it, three rags emerge. And on these rags, there's writing, there's words that I, I can't understand. I can't read. I don't, I don't know what they mean. And then I see Jesus step down from the throne. He comes down the steps and he comes over to this man And he takes the rags and he opens the first one up and he begins to have a conversation with this man. And I can't hear all of it, but at one point I hear the man say, but Lord, 
I built this for you. I built this for your glory. I, I don't understand. And Jesus looked back at him and he said, I did use it for my glory, but you never built it for me. You built it for your fame, not mine. And all of a sudden, the stature of this man starts to change. And he obviously can see that, you can see looking at him that uh, his heart is heavy. And he realizes as Jesus is speaking that it's true. That whatever this was, it wasn't built for God. Even though God ended up using it for his glory, this man built it for his fame. And then Jesus opens the other rag with the writing on it. And he has a conversation with the man. And then I hear the man say, but Lord, I, I served in your house. I was a leader in the church for many, many years. I did this for you. I, I, I led in the church for you. And Jesus said to him, you didn't lead it for me. You were so fixated on having influence and gaining authority. And you listened to your own will your human will, and you didn't listen to the voice of my spirit as you led. You didn't lead for me. And the man continues to become distraught. He's very concerned and he's a little confused. And then Jesus opens the last rag with the writing on it. And Jesus has a conversation with the man and the man says, but Lord, I followed all your rules. I, I followed your rules with everything that was in me. And Jesus said, yes, but rarely did you ever follow them because you actually loved me. Usually you did it because it was your pride and your self-righteousness and you wanted to look better than those around you. And I can remember just the somber moment that came in this room, came into the room and this man was beside himself, just completely distraught. And Jesus took the rags and he walked over to the fire that was before the throne and he put them into the fire and instantly they were consumed. Jesus then walks to the side of the room and he puts his hand up on the wall and as soon as he touches it, a door appears that was not there before and he opens it and he ushers the man through and he says, eternity is yours, but your reward is very little. And the man walks through and Jesus lets go and the door closes behind him. Jesus goes back up the steps and he returns to his throne and he sits down and then he looks over to the woman who's standing there holding her vessel and having just seen this interaction go down, she's like, Lord, I, I, I don't know what I have to offer you. I, I'm not a person of great means or accomplishment. I, I, I don't know what I have to give you. And church, I, I'm telling you, I, I feel like I, I saw Jesus begin to smile. And I mean, it's difficult to really say for sure from what I was seeing in the vision because of all the fire and the bright light, but it, it seemed like he began to smile. And he said, pour your life out before me. And so the woman began to pour out her vessel and these beautiful gems came out of her vessel. And you could tell that she was just in shock and she was like, Lord, I, I don't understand. What is this? What, what are these? Where did they come from? And Jesus comes down off of the throne and he stands beside her and he said, do you want to know what these are? Do you want to know what these are? This is your faithfulness and your long suffering with my church. And I got to tell you guys, having been in church leadership myself, what Jesus said next really shook me to my core. And I don't know if Jesus is trying to soften the hearts of his bride regarding people with disabilities. And I, I think that's something that we need to pray about. But Jesus said, this is for your long suffering and your faithfulness. My church, leaders in the church that you attended said that you were not fit for duty 
that you were not fit to serve in my house. And instead of it making you bitter, you chose to remain faithful and you continued to come and you seized other opportunities that I gave you. And the woman is just in complete shock. And Jesus says, do you want to know what these are? Do you know what these, these are? And he says to her, this is your kindness. This is the kindness that you showed consistently to people that were less fortunate than you are. All the phone calls, the notes, the letters, visiting with people, people who just needed a friend. This is the kindness that you showed all those individuals. And then Jesus picks up some more gems. And he says, do you know what these are? He said, these are the joy of your testimony. And he said, you were always eager and willing whenever the opportunity in life presented itself to share your testimony of what I had done in your life. And many, many came to know me because of your willingness to share the joy of your testimony. And then Jesus took the gems and he walked over to the fire and he put them into the fire and the gems were not consumed and the gems remained. And then Jesus walked back to this girl and he put his hand up on the wall and the door appeared and he pushed it open and he said, eternity is yours and great is your reward, my good and faithful servant. And she walked through the door and Jesus stood there for a moment and I thought, oh, I think Jesus is gonna follow her. And then Jesus took his hand off of the door and it closed and he turned around and he just stared me right in the eyes, right at me. And I'm like, I thought this was a spectator thing. Like I didn't think this was personal. <laughs> and that reverent fear began to came, come over my life again. And Jesus walked right up to me and he stood right before me and he took his hand and he reached his hand into my chest. And when he pulled it out, his hand was covered in tar. And I began to weep. And I'm like, Lord, I, I don't understand. What have I done? How, how do I fix it? What, what is this sin? And Jesus said, my servant, look. And he began to push and, and wipe away the tar. And he said, look, there's still gems in there. There's still works that are pleasing to me but the bitterness of your heart is snuffing out the joy of your salvation, the joy of your testimony. And I weeped and I said I was sorry and I'm like, Lord, I, I, I'll, I'll fix it, I'll fix it. And Jesus looked at me and he said, deal with the bitterness of your heart for time is short. And then the next thing I knew, I was back in my seat and worship was continuing. And I just broke down in tears and I just weeped like a baby the rest of the night. I couldn't sing. I just stood there in awe of what God had showed me. And church, I don't know if any part of this is helping you see the internal things, the heart issues, the heart things of God that really matter. You see, in the church world and in general, in life as humans, we love to polish the vessel and make the exterior look so beautiful and make it seem so perfect. But then on the inside, there's nothing. There's nothing. After all, isn't this what we saw Jesus deal with with the Pharisees? So I put before you today that with these scriptures and with this vision, I pray that it minister to your heart and that you see the importance of seeking after the things that delight God and that the work that we do matters. 
It matters. It has eternal value. And I pray for myself and for this house that when life presents us with opportunities to glorify our King in heaven, that we will seize the opportunity and we will take grasp of the moment. I also think that there's another lesson that needs to be learned and here in current culture in our world and the things that are going on and all the hate. I think God's speaking to us about not judging one another in the sense of who is fit and who is not fit to do great things for the kingdom of God. I'm so thankful that the Holy Spirit showed such a contrast to me. It humbled me. It checked my heart to to ask, Lord, is there anybody that I've written off that I never should have, that is still a vessel for you that is capable through the empowerment of your Holy Spirit to do great and mighty works for your kingdom. Oh God, forgive me. Forgive me. And remember that question I told you guys about at the beginning when I was five years old and I asked the Lord, Lord, why don't you use people today like you did back then? And he said, I still can, but are you willing to pay the price that they did? And I started to look at it in relationship to Elijah. Elijah had to forsake the opinions and perceptions of the world he was in to honor God. All of his nation had turned against God that was in front of him. And these prophets, these false prophets were serving a false God. And he alone stands in the moment instead for God and says, no, I'll stand for God. I'm willing, Lord, even though it's just me and even even though I'm putting my life on the line, I don't care. Because the only thing that really matters is being a vessel for your service. The shape and the quality and the look of the vessel isn't what matters, church. It's what's inside that matters. It's the state of our heart, the position of our heart towards the things of God. And I pray right now that we would be made known of that and that the Holy Spirit would speak to us and that we would choose this day to recognize that everyone has potential for the kingdom of God and that we want to be willing, regardless of what it is, to stand up and say, Lord, no matter what the world says, I'm here. Use me as your vessel. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this day. I thank you for your word and your scripture. Holy Spirit, I thank you for teaching us and showing us things in a way that we can better comprehend and understand. And I pray that your, your conviction would move upon this place and everyone that's listening, Father, and that we would be convicted in areas that we need to be, God, and that we would be affirmed in the areas that you are delighting in. And I pray right now that you would just repurpose us on this day to run hard after you, God, and that we would seize every opportunity that we have to glorify your name and to do the work of your kingdom, God. And Father, if anybody's watching right now that doesn't have a relationship with you, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would make yourself known and that your conviction would reveal the need of a savior in their life and that they would submit to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that he paid for the remission of sins and that they can be made whole, that they can be redeemed and that they would choose on this day to become a vessel for the works of your kingdom and that they would go forth and shine your light and your glory into this world, God. I give you praise for all that you've done and all that's to come in your precious and holy name. Amen, amen. God bless you, church. I pray that you have a wonderful rest of your day. Remember, there's always an opportunity to be a vessel for the Lord. God bless you.